we've had a great number of discussions here today, fabulous guests um, throughout the day, and, and we've talked about content, we've talked about a lot of things. Let's talk some more about money. Let's talk about um, what a phenomenal year last year was in terms of fundraising. It was $130 billion raised uh, by startups, $56 billion by VCs. Um, that's a 20-year high. This is the most that's been raised by startups in, since the dot-com boom. And you know, with this massive amount of dry powder left with all of these VC funds, it looks like it's going to keep rolling for the next few years. So is it good times roll and, and everyone's going to raise money and everyone's going to become gazillionaires? Like, wh what are these numbers not telling us? As long um, as Masa Sun keeps investing. Okay. So SoftBank, yeah? Okay, that's a major... SoftBank effect. I think there's so much money from the top down. Every fund... I think it's, we've known each other for a long time, and I would say it was a rare event to have a $1 billion fund, and now every fund is a billion dollar fund, it feels like. Well, he raised $45 billion in 45 minutes. <laughs> pretty which good. Which is pretty good. I mean, I, I think like the, the thing that I would be careful of, though, is fundraising, like raising money is really not that hard at the end of the day, right? So it's, it's actually, getting money back to your investors and, and the investors, investors, that's the hard part. And so uh, I would say let's not applaud the amount of money that's in the system. Let's applaud the money that's finally starting to exit. But we still need to see a lot more exits for people to do well. Yeah, I think uh, one of the legends of our industry who was up here earlier, Mr. Bill Gurley, uh, reminds us that it's a super cyclic thing. And um, it used to be that VC total dollars in the VC would go from a low point of about 17 or 18 billion a year to like 32 or 34. Now that's way warped, where it's so much more capital into the VC ecosystem. Um, and typically, returns were correlated in the lean years where there was less money, returns were better. And in the super abundant years, returns were suppressed because it was too much money chasing too few deals. I think what's warped it all is the markets are so much bigger now. We've got, you know, what, three and a half billion people on the internet, got uh, everyone with a, you know, mobile phone. So now the exits are, can be much, much larger, but there's still only a handful of them. And so, yeah, I, I agree. More money is usually not a good thing. Mm. Um, you want, you need to be way more discriminant during abundant times. So do you, does this make you extra cautious when you approach different investments? Um, it takes a long time. And invested in Lyft, how many 2010, years? 2010, $5 million valuation. Mm. Yeah, nine years overnight. Still on success. the board. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it depends on where you're entering. So mm -hmm. if you're at the day one phase, everything's a seven year overnight success. Yeah. Be patient. For, for me and our team, it's go with what you know. Be be really precise of why you're doing it. Don't worry so much about five years from now. It's hard to tell the future. Look, everything's revisionist history. Yeah. It was Zimride back in 2010. 2010. Right. Took them two and a half years to get to Lyft. All right. So in talking with other VCs, both before this panel and in, in recent days, as we look at other big macro events, not only this massive surge in funding that's come in, we're still tallying the numbers for this year, but it looks like it's going to be on par. Um, you know, and looking at things like, um, you know, the trade war with China or some of the, you know, antitrust moves that are afoot in Washington. There's all these macro issues that are happening. But the VCs that I talked to are just like, no, we, we focus on the bottom up. Do you guys agree with that? I, I, or not so much? For us, we're yeah. consumer internet. So okay. we're down in LA, much different from up here. And we run a startup studio. We're starting from inception day zero. So, uh, Dollar Shave Club, when that started in our offices, I, don't, I knew nothing about nine, Gillette had 90% of the market. We don't know anything. We just go build things. Right. And eventually, Pac-Man led the A. We eventually sold to Unilever. For us, consumer behavior is changing in the sense of the phone is everything, right? right? The number one attention grabber is Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook. And you have to go build something that's going to distract that person and go do something else. And today, most likely, they have, you're going to get them to pay for it. So for me, I don't really think about some of the bigger macro as the bigger funds that they did. Right. Yeah, um, for, so I am a computer science engineer, complete nerd. I am not a macroeconomist. I never worked on Wall Street. I don't know how to predict the economy. I have no idea how to predict market cycles, and I don't even try. 
Um, so I, I try to stay super focused on what are the major technological shifts that can underlie a lot of success and then try to pick incredible winners, you know, incredible CEOs, leaders in those areas. And, and just do that with our heads down, no matter what's happening at the big macro, mm -hmm. and sort of dollar cost average, right? Like invest when it's going up and invest when it's going up. But we put around the same amount of money out each year. Mm -hmm. It changes a little bit in the abundant years like now when prices go up, but not, not dramatically. But our startups are affected by this macro stuff. I do a lot of physical product companies. All the goods are manufactured in China they're all uh, you know getting hit by tariffs and their goods are now 25% more expensive to their consumers so like that has real impact on us but uh, it's not it doesn't factor into the investment theme you know we, we're a series a firm we average holding periods like 8 8 or 9 years for us so the world's going to change a lot in that right. period of time yeah i mean i i think about it more from the perspective of you know, floodgate invests early way too early barely questionably legal too early <laughs> and and in that stage we aren't thinking about exit we aren't thinking about growth the only thing we care about is getting to product market fit hmm. and so we spend all of our energy on that zero to one phase and that means everything looks different i think our board meetings look different from what they look like at the series a b c level uh, the questions that I'm asking, the things that I'm trying to teach to our founders are totally different because their questions are different, right? Our CEOs are like, okay, I, I might be firing someone tomorrow and I've never fired a person in my entire life. What do I do? Or they're thinking, I just got money, but I don't have customers. I barely understand what product I'm building. I haven't totally told my investors everything that I don't know or everything that isn't going well, now what do I do? And there's sort of this miracle that's supposed to happen, and at the end of that, I get even more funding, and I'm supposed to have this thing called product market fit, and it's like magic. There's a miracle mile that happens in between. And so I feel like my job is to be that co-conspirator that helps our founders get through that stage. But that looks totally different in the next round and the round after that. You know, So when you're raising $100 million, then trade wars with China and all this other stuff comes into play. But when you're at like the idea phase and you're just trying to fight to get another customer and live to fight another day, then it, like the questions you're asking, the questions you're answering, the things you're worried about looks totally different, and, and I embrace that. All right. So it sounds like some of those big picture things don't affect as much, but there are certain industries that you see starting to pop up, starting to emerge as areas that are worth a lot more attention. I know, you know, Peter, you and I have talked a lot about the scene in LA and everything that you've been doing in, in, in science. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what's emerging in LA and, and some water. of the direct to consumer. That's wa water, liquid oh, death. Boy. Um, look, I, Does I, everyone I, know the backstory on liquid death? It'll murder your thirst. No. Uh, look, I, the, we look at the world as, we built products for 15 to call it millennials, however age that is. If you look at it, I think there's the, I take a thesis of there's evil corporation is part of everything. Whether it's Monsanto or Boeing or telcos or, or tobacco, they're lying to you. And consumers are looking for like the truth, the newest one. Whether it's the startups that were on stage earlier, the startups that are growing, the Glossiers of the world, the Albers of the world, people want authenticity from the beginning of up. And for us, we are trying to take advantage of that in a sense, like tell a story. This is. If you Google this, this is the most viral thing I've ever touched. It's bananas. Like someone just tattooed their, our logo on their leg. Things like two months old. So the idea that you can build and go after big companies, we took 30% market share from Procter & Gamble, from Gillette, from Razor Blades on the internet. With Dollar Shave Club. It can be done today. And so we look at the markets of entertainment, media and entertainment, which is more of the television doesn't exist. What are you going to build here? We have we built two of the top 100 apps, Wishbone and Yarn. That's just entertaining teenagers, more entertaining than the other apps. How do you get them entertained to do those things? And then for us, we think consumer packaged goods, there's a ton to be done there. And then uh, eSports. So we incubated a company called Play Versus, hopefully some of you know. High school eSports, we're in 10 states today. And so it's all these categories that are new, I have no idea what we're doing, hopefully they work out. But 
you know, for us, if we believe in it, we keep building, the world's going to change. Right. And you have, what, about two dozen companies right now? We have everything. You've got everything. I got, okay. I right. got a We're jacket full of products. Uh, I have bags of products back there. Everything from CBD to uh, underwear that blocks electromagnetic radiation to renting camping gear. Uh, but right now, it's water and esports. Sounds good. David, you don't really invest that much in CBD patches or liquid death or anything like that. You're kind of focused on crypto and AI, and you've done some robotics investments as well. What's, what's compelling about any one of those that makes you think that you're going to be able to get the type of return that you promised to investors over this very long-term basis that we talked about? Yeah, so really I've been doing three categories. Consumer products, so I did Nest and Dollar Shave Club, and, and those are really physical products that are sold to consumers. And we haven't done tons. We've done a few, a couple that have failed. Um, and that was sort of the last six, six or eight years. Um, still looking in that space, I think it's gotten a lot harder, and I just troll Peter's studio to find the next great one. But lately, I think the, the two biggest themes that we've been focused on, say, the last two or three years, are really automation, which is robotics, AI, machine learning, and crypto. I think they're the two most interesting sort of technology shifts. One is less a technology shift, it's more just a, a, a maturation of a bunch of different technologies that solve a real present world problem, which is uh, the need for automation, which is coming from the fact that we've got full employment in this country and having a super hard time hiring people to do a bunch of the uh, less interesting jobs. Uh, and then in the down economy, the flip side of that is people looking for ROI. So incredible opportunities around robotics and automation. And in crypto, that's more of a technological shift. It's, it's a total, total um, reaction, I think, to the dominance of the FANG companies. Um, this, this dominance of centralized data repository companies that are largely fueling their businesses off advertising and consumer data, and, and the sort of architectural change in, in crypto and blockchain is decentralization, is let the, let the consumer data be stored decentralized so no one company has it, um, and the consumer can revoke, pro, pro, provoke, uh, um, revoke their uh, authority if they want to. That's not really an altruistic point of view, though, I mean, I think what's really driving the excitement around blockchain apps or decentralized apps called dApps is the liability. Companies don't want to keep consumer data anymore. The cost of keeping it is so high between uh, GDPR and Europe and, the, you know, if you have a breach of consumer data, it can put your company out of business. So uh, I think there's an interesting trend around decentralization that we're exploring. Hmm. Interesting. Um and talking about different trends, one thing that we were talking about the other day was you were not fretting, but you were a little bit concerned over, <laughs> over what many you know, scientists are saying is the end of Moore's Law, which they expect to maybe eke out another five years or so of doubling the number of transistors on every integrated circuit every two years. And so you were saying, you know, this is coming to an end. It could create this massive stagnation, you know? It could stall a bunch of these you know, types of advances that we, Silicon Valley and other hubs have come to rely on, or it could give rise to something else. And, you know, maybe you're making a few bets around that. I know that you're, I don't know if you've actually formally made those bets yet. Yeah, or, no, I mean, for, for me right now, it's just sort of, I love to pontificate about, uh, about things. And so this, this is sort of, uh, it was driven by several conversations I had with electrical engineering professors of mine uh, from Stanford. And, and they're fretting about the fact that Moore's Law is coming to an end. I have a question. And are they fretting? Are they stressed out about it? Like they are. How? They are. Because um, th they're worried that the industry hasn't fully reacted to that and that there are, there are large companies still very much in denial. So, so, you know, moving to seven nanometers. So how small these, you don't really print, you're basically etching using chemicals um, in order to pursue Moore's Law, which is basically... Uh, you're putting more and more transistors into the same amount of space and basically with the same amount of cost. And that's really what's given us the headroom to create more applications that run faster, that do more cool things. Um, and the, the question is, like, how do we get more of that power um, if, if the, the actual semiconductor industry is hitting sort of this... this uh, this top of the market for them. And so um, one of the things that, that we've been thinking about is, well, does that really move things more? You know, and I was thinking about sort of this notion of, well, decentralization, is that what's happening? Or 
If Moore's law does come to an end, does that mean more things actually move back into the cloud? So there's like these weird trends that's pulling you in all these different directions. Uh, we do believe that things will become much more uh, specific to a particular type of application. So if you look at the PhD research that's coming out of Stanford in, in this area, you'll actually create specific types of hardware for specific applications. And so um, when you move that to the consumer, it's like, will we really hold like 10 different devices? Probably not. So what does that actually mean for infrastructure? What does that mean for the consumer experience? Um, there's some things that we need to figure out technically. And as investors, you should just know that all of the stuff that we've been investing in, it's all because of these exponential laws. It's the exponential compute capacity that we have out there that enables us to have this great investment that then grows exponentially. And the truth is data actually is now growing exponentially. And there's still a lot more headroom for data because so many more devices are now finally coming online. And the amount of tweets and Instagram photos that people are doing is just increasing at a rate that we've never seen before. So if data is being captured by autonomous vehicles, by consumers in ways we've never seen, but compute is actually more and more limited, you have to ask the question, where's the opportunity? There's probably going to be stuff in Things are very technical, but then there's going to be really interesting consumer solutions that you will discover along the way that I think will be game-changing uh, for the way we interact with technology. Okay. Um, so um, one thing that we, we were talking a little bit about um, before this, in addition to some of these major changes, macro as well as kind of what it means bubbling up, you know, when they reach certain scientific limits. Um, is this um, the sense of, of, of tech clash that's been happening recently? Um, rage and, culture. I'm sorry. They call it rage culture. Rage culture, but some tech clash happening um, with you know some people rightly or wrongly feeling very frustrated that um, a lot of tech companies have contributed to homelessness um, because of the rising housing costs or that they haven't been good stewards of our data. So I'm curious, as you are advising these very early companies, what advice are you giving them now? And how are you helping them navigate this so they don't become an evil company later on or something like that? Don't be evil corp. No, uh, come on. <laughs> no, look, I think there's the pros and cons of it all. More than any time, founders, investors are paying attention on the nuances and little things that you may have not noticed, whether that be composition of board, diversity on the team, it's, there's like, you, we're paying attention. Like I'm counting heads and telling CEO, why, what's the count, what are you doing? What are we doing this week about this? In terms of, I think GDPR and data, mm -hmm. it's interesting, as we put more regulation in the space, whether that's data protection, GDPR particularly, privacy, you end up letting the big players stay in power because the overhead cost for a startup to moderate all their content. I was talking with somebody who said, we got, you gotta moderate all your content. I'm like, how many users? 100,000, no. A million, no. That startup has 10 employees, 15 employees. Facebook has tens of thousands of people. So the budget to make sure every piece of content is monitored. GDPR, a full staff for legal on privacy. It, the burden means the small startups aren't going to be able to afford to do some of the things that all the big companies can afford all day. So, to me, that's all we do pay attention to that. So, it's so the risk higher? To, so, is the risk higher then because they're younger and not as developed? I mean, research? I'm like, and honestly, half the shit, half the stuff we do is probably, you know, maybe on the edges. <laughs> of, yeah. We'll see where the law goes. Um, okay. But we pay attention, obviously, and there's tools and technology stacks you build against. Yeah to protect yourself. But. I think it's more, you know, I, I love seeing the people here today who are investors because, you know, when I, when I first started investing 11 years ago, I, it, it was very common for me to be the token woman and, and I was the person of color on the, on the board or the investing team. And so this is sort of what represents more of what the world ought to look like. 
right? And, and if you are putting your dollars into companies that you believe in alongside other investors, that's the voice. And if you are then going out and encouraging the cap table, the full cap table to be diverse, and then the teams to be diverse, and the viewpoints to be diverse, that's the way we create change. We're not just changing technology, ultimately. We have to change culture. 25 years ago when I started at Apple, tech was the underdog. We didn't rule any industry. Tech did not dominate any industry except for pure tech, like personal computers. Now tech has totally dominated music, media, television, um, not, not yet sports, but certainly changing, impacting sports. Um, soon automobiles, CPG, advertising. So when you become dominant, you have to behave completely differently than when you're the underdog. And this industry has not woken up to the fact that it has a totally different set of responsibilities, humility, and behavior that it needs. Hmm. And the journey continues. And on that, we are out of time. Thank you so much. <laughs>